My dangerous trip to South Sudan, where photography was forbidden, and if caught, you could be arrested. It was my 142nd country, from December 17 to 18, 2015. As soon as I got my visa in Kampala, Uganda, I was ready to visit South Sudan. So I caught Ethiopian Airlines from Entebbe to Juba, the capital of South Sudan. Getting off the bus, I boarded a Bombardier Q400 aircraft. Who would want to go to Juba? but apparently it was a full flight. Leaving Entebbe, I saw all sorts of interesting aircraft like Eagle Air's Let 410. It was only an hour flight northbound as seen on this route map. Leaving Entebbe, we crossed over Lake Victoria. Now I leave Uganda onwards to South Sudan. Flying to a war-torn, newly formed nation, I didn't know what to expect. I could only hope for the best. On my flight, my camera broke, which was probably a good thing because photography was forbidden in all of South Sudan. On such a short flight, only drinks and a muffin were served. I saw isolated lakes, jungles, and roads along the way. Here we are arriving in Juba, South Sudan. In such a big capital city, all the roads seemed to be dirt roads. Juba was founded in 1922 and had grown to 500,000 inhabitants. In South Sudan, 12 million people lived. This was the newest country in the world, formed in 2011. Juba's airport was swarming with UN aircraft, World Food Program aircraft, and many of them Russian aircraft. This Ilushan 76 aircraft, operating for the World Food Program, was operated by Almaty Air out of Kazakhstan. The ramp was full of old aircraft, including this Boeing 727 cargo aircraft. Juba Airport was ranked as the world's worst airport, but it was a very busy airport. Very busy airport, yeah? There were over 400 NGOs working in South Sudan. This Antonov 72 had its engines on top of the wing. Hey, that's true, that a lot of tall people live here? Yes, <laughs> they are very tall. <laughs> Even taller than you? Yes. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Inside the arrivals hall, the place was swarming with passengers. Outside the arrivals area, people waiting for their passengers to arrive. Arabic was spoken in South Sudan. My host, Rosie, a South Sudanese, would meet me upon arrival at the airport. So like the girl can see I've been now, been a lot in the Narbe. Ah, he can. Narbe in this. Rosie, nice to meet you finally. <laughs> nice to meet you too, Lisa. So what was the guy uh, screaming about in the car? Oh, this one was telling me to tell you to stop taking pictures. Oh, it's not allowed? Yeah, it's not allowed here. What about for you though? Uh, I'm a local so I can take pictures. Ah, but a okay. foreigner is not allowed to take pictures. Oh, really? Yeah. Everywhere within the country. Oh wow, so I gotta be so careful. Oh yeah, you have to be very careful because they will arrest you. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going home now, huh? Yeah, be careful, hide your camera, yeah. please. We jumped into a tuk-tuk and got a ride to our home. The roads were indeed dirt roads and very bumpy. <laughs> this is Rosie's shop here. Hi. People in Africa love to braid hair, and South Sudan was no exception. Here they braided the hair in such an unusual way which I had never seen before. There was no way to really explain it because I didn't even know the name of this hairstyle. Her neighborhood seemed to be pretty safe, but I wasn't sure, so I had to ask. I'm just curious, your neighborhood, have you heard any shooting here? Yeah. So there's fighting sometimes in your streets? Yeah, so many times, you know. Uh, Alright, have you seen um, people shooting each other? Yeah. When there is fighting, always people run to get their guns, you know, and start shooting each other. Oh, really? Have you seen people die too? Yeah. Oh, man. How's the situation this week, though? Or this you last can, week? You can never predict uh, what is gonna happen, you know? Oh, really? It's just like, usually just surprise people. So I need to be careful. Indeed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. There's no flights on the weekend, you know? Yeah, no and flights, yeah. The weekend, the airport closes? Yes. <laughs> <sighs> Isn't the weekends more peaceful though? No, as I said before, you know, you can never predict yeah, anything yeah. in this country. Anything can happen anytime, anywhere. So what do you think? Uh, I was just thinking, um, like, in a hotel could be much better, mm. more safer, because they usually have security guards, you know. Mm, okay. Yeah, it's more secure. Sure. All right. But what about touring the city though? I want to go like look around. See what's yeah, you can go. Yeah, you can. Maybe I should find someone to go with, yeah? Yeah, you cannot go alone. This country is never safe. <laughs> Anything can happen. Okay, so Juba is the capital, but what's the second largest city? We don't have second largest city, apart from Juba. 
So it's just Juba and villages. Yeah. That's it. You don't recommend going to other towns? I don't really. Well, that's gonna be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I took a look at Rosie's accommodations. Oh, so a couch and then a bed and some other stuff, but just a room. That is pretty small, but it's nice. This was inside the compound. This is the bathrooms. Across the street was a little kiosk that sold staple goods. I went out to a restaurant and was surprised to find Hungarian soup being offered on the menu. Rosie could host me because her landlord said that he doesn't want to be responsible if anything happens to me even though I was inside a compound because there's been some killings in the area nearby. It's unsafe here in Juba. I had to find another place so I went to the hotel and it cost $90 and the other one cost $70. So I had a rough time, so I called up another couch surfing member who happened to be from Uganda and he couldn't host because he lives in a compound in staffing accommodations, but he was able to meet up with me and the hotel that I was at, Dream Palace Hotel, offered to drive me to this place across town which took 10 minutes. He met me here and he found this place. This place is affordable, so this is what I got. A bed, mosquito nets, a fan, and then the bathroom, which is dark. There's no lights in here, but there's a squat toilet and then a cold shower here. Well, I might just leave tomorrow because it's been too complicated here in South Sudan and Juba because I don't have a host. And then you're not allowed to take any photography because that's illegal and you can get put in jail for that. It hasn't been a problem for me because my camera broke, but I still have my video camera. I've been trying to sneak in some videos here and there, but it's uh, risky. Then the hotel receptionist, Felix, came to check on me and kill the mosquitoes with an electric SWAT. I saw mosquitoes somewhere. No, outside are no problem. But if they get inside... Big problem. Yeah, but they can die with this. Hey, what about that hole? They will not get inside at night. They cannot uh, manage it to get inside with the holes. The next morning, day two. I'm Jason. 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 Where are you from? I'm from Belgium. Thank you so much for letting me stay here and uh, charging my cell phone. <laughs> Have a nice day, okay? I'm gonna go tour around. Yeah. How do you say your first name? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So where are you from? I'm from Uganda. Well, I'm happy to come here to visit. Okay. But I'll only stay one day because I don't want to spend the weekend and spend too much time. Yeah. I hear there's problems here. Uh, but what about mosquitoes and malaria? That's the biggest, biggest problem. The biggest problem? Yeah. Even the hospitals here, they treat malaria and typhoid. Oh Basically, man. Basically, most of them. So I can't get bitten by mosquitoes so <laughs> here. <laughs> What's the name of this hotel? Concorde. And what's the price do you think of this? I think it's around 120, 150. Just for a place in Juba. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here in South Sudan and I'm trying to change money, but you can't change anything less than $100. <laughs> Those people behind us help me out and I'll be able to survive for one day. We ordered breakfast at the hotel. Explain to me what is the exchange rate actually here in South Sudan for the dollar? <laughs> <laughs> for exchange rate, you don't have a stable exchange rate. Today, if it's $1,400, tomorrow it will be maybe $1,200. After mm. three hours, it can go up to 1,800. Maybe before you know, someone tells you it's 1,500 or 2,000. It goes up to 2,500 actually. And what's the official rate at the bank? At the bank, it ranges from 299 to 357. So there's a huge difference. Yeah, very huge difference. And when you go to the bank, you cannot get dollars actually. As a civilian, you cannot go to the bank and you get the dollar. They simply tell you they don't have dollars. So maybe they have the people they give the dollars to sell in black money. Maybe. This is the country which has the, the most unstable economy I've ever seen. Malaria was a big problem in South Sudan, so I asked Muhumuza about it. So it seems like malaria is a big problem here, huh? Yeah, it's the biggest problem. Right? If, if you don't get malaria in a month, like two times, you're lucky. Oh, really? So have you gotten malaria? Yeah, I've gotten malaria. Maybe my body is strong, like yeah. five times in a year. You got it five times in one year? Yeah. <laughs> so that's good though. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Because most people get it more. Yeah, yeah. like <laughs> ten times in a year. Oh man, it's a serious business. Yeah, it's serious. <laughs> if, if, you, if you have a hospital here for malaria, you probably make money. 
<laughs> oh, really? So I should open up a hospital yeah, for malaria? Yeah, you should do that. I'll think about that one. <laughs> so I ordered some vegetable rice while he ordered some French toast with coffee. <clears throat> so many people are worried about me over here in South Sudan. <laughs> do you have any stories about what happened in the last few months since you've been here? Yeah. I've lost friends, I've lost workmates. They were like from the bank to withdraw some money. Yeah. Then uh, I think some guys spotted them, they have money, and then mm. they followed them up. They took the money and killed them. There were three. When they saw the vehicle for the thugs, yeah. of course, this one they had to speed up. Mm. So these ones, they started shooting, they killed them, and then took the money as well. How many co workers died? All of them. So you have to be so careful. Yeah, you have to be so careful because anyone has a gun. Oh, are they use yeah. guns here instead of knives? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can be killed by anybody. You can be killed by police. You can be killed by army. You can be killed by just the civilians. Has anything happened to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, some time back we were from work at around 10.45 p.m. Okay. Then uh, we reached a certain junction. We were branching home, yeah. they stopped us and then uh, they told us to get out of the vehicle. We got out and then uh, they asked us, where are you from, Uganda? Stand there. You, Eritrea, stand there. You, South Sudanese, okay. stand here. And you, uh, Kenyan, stand that side. So like they separated the South Sudanese and the foreigners. Then they started asking, uh, where are your guns? So we like, we don't have guns, we, are, we work in a hotel, we don't have guns. They were like, where are your passports? Uniforms where are your visas? On? Yeah, you from, uniforms you, own, you can read, Karen Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, they were like, where are your guns? We were like, we don't have any guns, okay. They were like, okay, they, now they started searching us. Only foreigners, mm. not South Sudanese. They searched us and then uh, had some some dollars, a guy, he was armed, he had a very big gun with the, you know, so he would probably get scared even if it was you. So yeah. He checked my wallet, had $110, he took it, and then I'm like, please, sir, he's like, please for what? So I'm like, okay. Did they check the South Sudanese to make sure they no, were actually they didn't. true? They didn't. So you can they say didn't. you're South Sudanese and they wouldn't check you? Of course, when you say you're South Sudanese, they ask you in Arabic. Ah. Ita when? Where are you from? So I need to be careful here. Can I just report stuff to the police if anything happens? If you're white, you can report and then maybe they can follow up. But for Ugandans, for Kenyans, these people hate Ugandans so much. But why do really Ugandans do. come here anyway? We come to work, get money. You but... can't find a job in Uganda? No, we have jobs in Uganda, but they pay less. And even if you're getting the same salary here in Uganda, it's easier for you to get the salary here than in Uganda. For example, if you get $100 in uh, Uganda, yeah. it's, it's difficult to save $100 in Uganda. Oh. But it's easier here to get $100. So we save our tips and that's all. How much do you earn per month? $50. What about in Uganda? How much could you get earn in salary? You can earn uh, up to $200. Yeah, but it's harder to save. Yeah, it's really, really hard to save. Then it was time to take a tour of Juba on a Boda Boda or a motorcycle with Muhu Musa and the driver. Don't use your camera anywhere. Low profile. Low profile, okay. I was told to maintain a low profile to avoid being stopped by the police. We drove through the streets of Juba to pass by a few famous sites. Luckily for me it was December, but normally from March until October, it was rainy season. This compound had a statue of an important soldier for independence, but since photography was forbidden, we didn't stop. After passing by this compound, we would pass by the next statue of the founding president of South Sudan. On the way, we would see UN buses. There were no Western brands, but rather local brands like the Kogpun Petroleum Station or City Petroleum. This life insurance ad read, Don't gamble with your life. Yet pedestrians tried to cross the street, but nobody would stop for them. There were more of UN vehicles and Red Cross vehicles everywhere. Then we came across the roadside bleachers honoring the first president. I looked opposite the bleachers to see the statue of John Garang, the man who led the Sudan People's Liberation Army. 
but I couldn't take any photos. How sad a country was so anti-touristic. This place was dedicated to the martyrs who gave their blood for independence and freedom. There were signs around town with presidential quotes like, We are for unity, peace, tranquility, and reconciliation. Another one said, We are for one vision, one mission, one nation. They did have solar panels on their streetlights, which was progressive. Here was a monument dedicated to the Addis Ababa Agreement from 1973. Next, we went to Oasis Camp where we had to pass through security to access the cafe. At the security post, they had a sign stating, No idle sitting for Oasis staff at security reception room. No charging of mobile phone or phone batteries at the security reception room. Apparently charging your phone was a problem. <laughs> What happened to that boat? It just crashed and no one cares about it? Even if you get an accident, a car, or it doesn't matter how, how much you bought the car or what. As long as when it gets accident, you just leave it there and you just walk away. We're here at Oasis Cafe. It's a calm area. The Humuza likes to come here to relax. <laughs> it's a good choice. You can't uh, take much photos in South Sudan, but at least over here it's more relaxing. Behind me is the Nile River, and it goes all the way from Uganda up north to Egypt, where it empties out into the Mediterranean. The Nile River starts in Lake Victoria. I wonder, is there any zoo in South Sudan? No? You? What's your name? Ismail. What do you do? I'm just riding Bora Bora. Oh, okay. Yes, I'm transported to something. Hey, look at this. What's this? That's unusual. So how long have you been a Bora Bora driver? Two years now. So. You enjoy it? Yeah. <laughs> what was your first job here in Juba? I can't explain that. Oh, you can't? Yes. You mean you're not allowed? Okay. <laughs> well, thanks for taking us here. Is there any botanical gardens here? So no botanical gardens, no zoo? No botanical gardens. Nothing like this. What about parks? Parks and... There, but far from Dubai. What about um, like wild animals, tigers, elephants? Yes, same, same. Outside the city? Yeah. You can go, but that will be risking your life as well. There's there, where the wars are. Are they shooting animals too? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. If, if you can't shoot a human being, like nothing, so an animal is I wonder if South Sudan will ever become tourist friendly. I think so it will, but in the next generation. So in 60 years from now we can come back as tourists. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Oh man, I'll be so old. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least I got to see something in my 24 hours here. Sitting in the outdoor cafe, I saw black pieces of burnt something falling from the sky. It turned out to be burnt grass. Then I saw another patron at the cafe, so I thought to go over to talk to her. I'm over here at the Oasis Park. Do you work here? No. You're just a visitor? Yeah. Oh, okay, nice. So, where are you from? From Tongfeng. Oh, Tongfeng. Yeah. That's where you say. But are you South Sudanese or no? I'm Uganda. Oh, Uganda. Okay, cool. Um, what's your name? I'm Aisha. Aisha? I'm Jason. Nice and to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah. You like this uh, Oasis Park? I like it. It's nice and peaceful? Oh, okay, good. Uh, how long do you expect to stay here? One year. Just one year. Then you go back to Uganda. Yeah. Mm, okay. All right. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I also met another patron who told me he wasn't a normal person. That meant he worked for the government and really didn't want to be disturbed. However, he was from South Sudan and was really tall. We went to the local market to find some fruits like papaya to buy. There were all sorts of vendors trying to sell their goods and other people busy at work like these construction guys. There was pineapple, cabbage eggs, and then there were the papayas. Across the walkway were more pineapples, and then bananas. In a marketplace like this, you even had to watch out for motorcycles like this guy. Walking through the marketplace, I saw many vendors selling all sorts of items, even fruits I was unfamiliar with. So well, just a question, how much are your bananas? And your papaya? Eight. Ten and five.
Veggies like carrots, pepper, ginger, okra, and avocado were also very popular. The one thing that can't be captured by film are the amount of flies I had to endure. But despite the annoyances, the staples were here. After my tour around Juba, it was time to say goodbye. So I stopped by Rosie's shop to bid farewell. Thanks a lot, Rosie, for everything. We've been in communication 10 months. I finally made it out here, but only for one day. <laughs> but at least I made it to my 142nd country. Before leaving, I ate the papaya I bought at the marketplace. Then it was time to get back on the motorcycle and head to the airport. I got back to the airport with plenty of time to spare. Again, the airport was busy with people, cargo, UN staff arriving, NGO members leaving, and business people coming and leaving. I never saw a busier airport than Juba International. UN vehicles were a common sight. The UN had over 12,000 personnel in the country. Juba wasn't photo friendly. You sure? I tried to get a video shot in front of the airport, but then a bystander asked. What are you doing? Huh? What are you doing? I just wanted to talk. Right here. Hold on. Is it okay? I didn't know why the common bystander was so curious about what I was doing. After all his questioning, I decided to just skip the idea. This was inside the airport as I tried to check in amongst the hundreds of passengers trying to check in for their flight. I could quickly see why Juba International was considered one of the worst airports in the world. Chaotic and disorganized. While I was standing in line to check in for my flight, a worker in plain clothes approached me and told me to turn off the camera otherwise he would cancel my flight ticket. After security, I waited in the waiting area until our flight was called. Once inside the airplane, I saw the tarmac full of Russian aircraft, including the Ilishan 76 and the Antonov 24, and the Twin Otter. The ramp was just full of airplanes parked back to back, and then the airlines like Rwanda Air and Ethiopian Airlines. The Ilishan 76 dwarfed all other airplanes. There was even a UN aircraft, like this CRJ-200. Taxi on the runway for departure, we passed the village situated right next to the airport. I guess it made for a good view if you liked watching airplanes pass by. And off we left, leaving Juba and my 24-hour experience of South Sudan. That airport must have had over 100 airplanes on the tarmac. Goodbye Nile River. On board, they served pineapple juice and a vegetarian meal. Arriving to Addis Ababa, I was glad to be back. I arrived to Addis Ababa now, and I'm going to transit to Dubai. After a quick transit through the Addis Ababa airport, I was on my way. Stay tuned for more adventures.